Uh, thanks very much. Um, so I, I think it's uncontroversial to say that uh, universities are, are intolerant, but it may not be quite so obvious that our science institutions are untrustworthy. And by that I don't mean that they're deliberately dishonest. I'm just saying they don't actually have the quality assurance mechanisms within them to make their, um, their work uh, trustworthy. Uh, in fact, both the universities and the science institution are captured universities, and at the root, they suffer from a lack of debate and argument within them. And that's really the basic problem behind the science institutions of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you, there are all sorts of things that you just can't say as a young person. It was interesting to hear Michael Sexton say that in universities. It's the same in the uh, science institutions. So I'm going to give some examples of, of this from the Great Barrier Reef because it's my area and hopefully show that yes, at least by example, there are some problems within these science institutions. Now doubtless you've heard about the Great Barrier Reef. There's at least 10 things that are killing the reef from climate change to sediment from farms, you name it, uh, virtually it's killing the reef. And there's a consensus statement by a whole bunch of scientists um, who are in the group uh, the in-group, I should say, uh, which informs government on the, the policy with, with regard to the reef. And in fact, uh, we're going to look at some of those claims that they've made and uh, put the other side of the argument. The argument that I'm going to put is the argument that wouldn't necessarily get you fired in every case, but a lot of it would be very, very damaging to the career of a young person. So you've doubtless heard that the reef is being killed by sediment, mud coming from farms, supposedly smothering the reef. Well, in actual fact, it's been well known for at least 50 years that there is no mud on the Great Barrier Reef, right? It's 50 kilometres offshore, and when you look at the sediment on the, sa on the bottom, it's coral sand, it's white calcium carbonate sand. There is nothing there from the farms. The farmers cannot be killing the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I should say that uh, I've had a bit of experience with this. The Marine Geophysics Laboratory had, you know, 20 or so geologists who worked on sediment on the Great Barrier Reef, and especially in the 1990s. And I was the technical guy, and we invented the instruments to measure sediment. In fact, our group has taken more measurements of sediment on the Great Barrier Reef than all the other groups put together. And yet that work that was done in the 1990s is now completely ignored by the consensus statement. They don't try to refute it. They just ignore it as though it never, ever happened. You've doubtless seen occasionally pictures of river plumes carrying supposedly mud onto the reef. They pop up every few years. And the reason they pop up every few years is that they only happen every few years. So recently, after the Townsville floods, this happened. There was a picture of one reef showing a little bit of slightly turbid water over it. And yet, and this was supposed to indicate the reef is dying from this, but actually it showed the opposite because there are 3,000 reefs on the Great Barrier Reef. And for one or two days, perhaps a handful of reefs, probably only two reefs, got a very, very small amount of sediment. For the next five years or a decade, there's going to be nothing. So another uh, example of, uh, you know, the reef isn't that badly damaged. The first big threat to the Great Barrier Reef was actually crown of thorn starfish, which munch away at the corals, sometimes in pl plague proportions. Most people don't know that crown of thorn starfish are not a feral animal like cane toads or rabbits. They are as Australian as kangaroos and koala bears, right? Not bears, koalas. And the, uh, the geological evidence indicates that those um, plays of crown of thorn starfish have been around for thousands of years more work that was done in the Marine Geophysics Laboratory in the 1990s. But this is entirely ignored. We're told that pesticides running off farms is killing the Great Barrier Reef. But when you actually drill into the, the data, right in the appendices of all the reports, you find that actually they mostly never even try to measure the, in, the pesticides on the Great Barrier Reef. They come much further inshore, close to the land, and even there, the pesticides are usually in such small uh, amounts they are not detectable to the most sci um, accurate scientific equipment. And out on the reef, don't even bother because they'll definitely be in that case. Then there's really crazy ones like pharmaceuticals from human waste is a medium risk to the, wheat, the reef. This is if you take a ha headache tablet, some of it passes through your body into the sewage system and out and, and kills the reef. You think, this is crazy. So you actually go down, you, you look at the, uh, the reports on this, and you find, well, where were the measurements? What did they measure on the reef? 
and you find, oh, well, I actually didn't measure it on the reef. You say, well, did they measure it in the river or did they measure it in, uh, inshore? No, they didn't do that either. Almost all the measurements are actually taken on the outfall of the sewage treatment plant itself. And even there, the levels are extremely low. So it doesn't take into account the billions of times dilution that it would then take to get to the reef. Remember, the reef is 50 to 100 kilometres off the coast. It's almost as far as Tasmania. That's how far as it is in many places. The water quality of the reef is supposedly degraded from all this horrible pollution coming in from the farms. And what is neglected is more work coming from the Marine Geophysics Laboratory that, in fact, the water quality around the reef is more or less the same as the Pacific Ocean because as much water comes in from the Pacific Ocean and then out in about eight hours as comes down all the rivers in an entire year. It's just physically impossible for you to really pollute the Great Barrier Reef waters. You've doubtless heard the amount of sediment of uh, coral has declined, but in fact, when you actually look at the data, there's about the same amount of coral now as there was when the uh, records began. You probably heard that uh, coral growth rates have fallen uh, from all sorts of things. In fact, if anything, they've probably increased by around about 10%. That will really get you into trouble if you say something like that. Then you've got corals, um, they don't recover from these mass mortality events. Now, look, there is no doubt that periodically enormous amounts of coral get killed. A cyclone is 100 kilometres across, and if it goes in at the right angle of the reef, it can, it can easily eliminate as much coral as, again, the state of Tasmania, all right? But within five years, it is likely to grow, it will grow back. Within 10 years, it's completely recovered. There was a 250% increase in the amount of cover on the, the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef in just between 2010 and 2016. So you, what you're seeing again and again and again is this amazing ability for the reef to recover from these events. A coral reef is actually growing as a pile of dead coral on, on top of a pile of dead coral that's formed over hundreds of thousands of years. It lives on the bodies of its dead ancestors, in fact. Now, of course, we've been told that rising temperatures are killing the reef, but when you actually look at the data, the best coral is actually north of Australia and Indonesia, and it's certainly not very good coral around Melbourne. It's obvious that the best coral is in the warm areas, and the same corals that live on the reef grow about twice as fast in Papua New Guinea and Thailand. All right. So, the science organisation will claim that their work is highly quality assured, but is it really? Now, I need to step back a bit and, and not just worry about reef science, but I need to worry about science in general. There's a thing called the replication crisis, and the replication crisis is where when they do uh, tests of peer-reviewed science, they actually find that it's wrong about half the time. It's an absolutely staggering statistic that half of the scientific literature, probably in the last 20 years, is wrong. And this isn't just some redneck from North Queensland who's just been fired from a university who's saying it, right? This is the, the major national scientific institutions. There's a guy called Richard Horton, who's the editor of one of the most famous uh, medical journals, The Lancet, and this is what he says about peer review. Now, remember, peer review is not when, when a dozen scientists pour over the work for months on end and they redo the experiment. It's just a quick read for a couple of hours in many cases. This is what he says. We know that the system of peer review is biased, unjust, unaccountable, incomplete, easily fixed, often insulting, usually ignorant, occasionally foolish, and frequently wrong. This is the main quality assurance mechanism which we are using to inform on policy on the Great Barrier Reef. This is what he said about the replication crisis. The case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by uh, studies with small sample size, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analysis, flagrant conflicts of interest, uh, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn towards darkness. Now, perhaps the, the father of the replication crisis is a guy called John Ionides, a Stanford University mathematician, and he published a paper, one of the most cited papers in all time in science, with the incredible title of Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. It's an incredible situation. Now, I often say that who is more, who is, well, I'll ask the question, who is more reliable, a used car salesman I hope there's none here. Or, well, actually, it doesn't matter if you are here. 
Who's more a used car salesman than a scientist? Can you imagine a used car salesman where half the cars he sold didn't work? Right? There is no profession on earth, I think, that is as unreliable, as untrustworthy as the science profession. And I don't say that with any sort of pride, considering I'm a scientist myself. So what would then happen, perhaps, if you said that there is a trustworthy problem, trustworthiness problem with some of our science institutions? By 2017, I'd reached the point where I could see that the consensus had huge problems. The consensus on the reef had huge, huge problems. We had the replication crisis, and legislation on the reef was affecting every major industry. Sugar, beef, dairy, bananas in North Queensland, all right? And we, were, we had our institutions um, saying all these things, which really wasn't checked, and you had to question whether their work was trustworthy or not. In particular, if their main quality assurance mechanism was peer review, which was recognised to have a 50% failure rate, why on earth would we trust those institutions? It was a, a fair but tough question, and every farmer in North Queensland would like to know the answer. And by the way, they've never been given an answer to that. Well, anyway, I made that uh, comment on the Alan Jones show, and I guess I thought that maybe those science institutions would say, well, Peter, your comments are wrong for whatever reason. We have much better quality assurance. We'd engage in some sort of respectful debate. But of course not. <clears throat> there were complaints called up to the dean's office and handed a couple of uh, counts of serious misconduct. Now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on, on the, the case. I'm actually not the best person to talk about it. I'm obviously a little bit too close to that. Um, but anyway, the Institute of Public Affairs uh, stepped in and they gave me a bit of legal help and uh, the university quickly responded with a, a broad scale email search. They had no reason to do it, they just felt like doing it, what can we find? And remember, I'm not, I wasn't, I, I, I must use the past tense, I wasn't a, uh, a public servant, I was an academic and the enterprise agreement says that in the academic freedom clauses I can express opinions about the operations of the university. Now I can tell you it's pretty scary when they've looked through all your emails and the first thing you think is, oh my goodness, what have I said? <laughs> and I, I read through these things and, and to my absolute amazement, I actually hadn't said anything stupid. <sighs> but anyway, there were some interesting things in there. I'll just go through some of them. More well, they weren't very funny, but the more remarkable things. Um, it's well known now that they, they didn't like me sending the, the allegations against me to my wife. That was... Uh, and then, when, and then later on, they accused me of lying about uh, this, which was even more remarkable. Uh, and then there was a student who emailed me, a, a very good student, very concerned about me, what was happening to me. And I said, look, JCU is no worse than all the other universities. I was actually quite complimentary to JCU, no worse than, in fact, I said there was others that were worse. And that they, uh, all universities were the same. They were Orwellian in the sense that they professed to have a free speech, but in fact they crushed it. Well, the university objected to the use of the word Orwellian, and they didn't seem to see the... <laughs> <laughs> they read my emails to get it. <laughs> but, but perhaps the best was uh, another student, uh, we were in a, a bit of a communication about technical matters on some robotics projects, and I sent to him a newspaper critic, uh, article of the bad publicity against J JCU with the byline, for your amusement. Well, JCU didn't like that. <clears throat> that was called the no satire directive because I had parodied, vilified, and satirized the disciplinary process, and that was more serious misconduct. I obviously wasn't showing enough respect for saying, for your amusement. But most of all, they were interested in just keeping me silent. That was the most important thing. Uh, then they started to vet my public lectures. I, I went to give a public lecture in the uh, Sydney Institute. They insisted on seeing my PowerPoint presentation. They, rem they asked me to remove seven of, uh, five to seven of those slides, including one where I asked, is there a robust debate without intimidation? Now, it turned out I'd been using this slide for about five years, uh, but they obviously thought that this might be responded to their uh, bad behaviour, uh, so it had a bit more poignancy. So I was really in a point now that I had to either fight or shut up. I was going to be completely muzzled, and we decided that we would fight. But the problem is that <clears throat> we ended up with 40 charges of misconduct. You can't, we needed money for the, uh, the campaign. To go crowdfunding, you can't say, I need 260 grand 
I've got 40 cases of serious misconduct. I can't tell you what they're about, um, but please hand over the cash. You've got to say what it's about. Otherwise, if there's something like sexual misconduct in there, they don't want to hand over cash. So you have to bare your soul. And that meant that we were, again, breaking JCU's illegal confidentiality uh, directive. Look, my biggest worry is that we were going to do the crowdfunding, I would have got 500 bucks and JC would have been really angry with me and I would have been fired anyway and had no money to fight. But we ended up in two campaigns getting 260 grand in just over five days, which was fantastic. It just shows that there is a lot of feeling out there about this whole freedom of speech uh, problem and the university problem. The interesting thing though was that the university managed the impossible of getting JCU to get The Guardian and Breitbart News to agree that they had been disgusting. So both sides of the political fence had agreed. The Australian agreed with the, um, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that they had done the wrong thing. Anyway, to cut a long story short, with the help of Stuart Wood and uh, Ben Kiston, Ben Jellis and Mitchell Downs and Amelia Hassan, uh, Judge Vasta ruled that in 28 different ways they'd been illegal. And more, more interestingly, and I think absolutely right, he said that JCU did not seem to understand academic freedom. And I think that's uh, completely correct. So what does this mean? I should say they're probably going to appeal, so we're not finished yet. So what does this mean? Well, does it mean um, that you know all academics can now breathe a sigh of relief and say more or less whatever they like, which is, was the situ is the situation if you, you read the enterprise agreement? I should step back a bit and uh, point out to those of you who don't know that uh, earlier this um, year, ex-High Court Judge Robert French released a review at the behest of the Education Minister Dan Tien on the problems of academic freedom on the campuses. And one of his main points was that the universities cannot invent codes of conduct to override academic freedom, which was in a sense exactly what JCU had done in my case. Now, um, J JCU is actually now on collision course, especially if they go to an appeal against uh, the results of the French review. I'm sure that they're still going to go ahead, but they are certainly on collision course. But does this uh, liberate, even with the French review coming in, will it liberate academics? The answer is certainly not, because all my case has really proven is that if you can get 260 grand of other people's money, go through a terrible time, and you know withstand these a very aggressive fascistic, almost Stalinistic uh, way that the university behaves, you might, if you're very, very lucky, um, get your job back, um, but you probably won't. Um, the fact is that what, what the other academics will see from this is that the truth is irrelevant, it's very, very dangerous, just stay safe. And that's a very, very sad situation I think that we've, we've ended uh, up in. So how do we solve it? I honestly don't know. The, the fundamental, the biggest problem, you can have all the great laws and the great constitutions and the French Review and all these things about the problems in the universities, but the fundamental problem in the universities is that it's been completely captured. So I think it would be fair to say that um, most of the people within the universities would be you know, left of centre, progressive, politically correct, and they don't, um, their, con their, their views uh, tend to be tolerated by the university administration. A lot of academics really don't care a great deal about intellectual freedom because it doesn't actually affect them a great deal. Their research isn't very controversial or it's of that controversial type which is accepted. And so the academics and the administrators, they do live in this bubble because their views don't actually correspond to the great outwashed out there and they certainly don't talk to the great out, uh, unwashed. So somehow or other, we've got to make our university academics and administrators more um, representative of community values. Only then can you end up genuinely getting debate. The comment that Michael Sexton made about what happens in the university tea rooms is absolutely right. Everybody knows what you're not allowed to say and what you can say. And the people who would have those um, maybe more politically correct views have no idea that you might be thinking something else because you never ever say what you're thinking in the universities. And don't think that the problems are just at some you know, northern university like JCU. Look at what happened to Jordan Peterson at Cambridge University. Melbourne University is every bit as bad as James Cook University. Well, it might not be every bit, but it's right up there. 
I think you've got to ask the question is that if, you, you know, if universities are really going to abandon academic freedom, which effectively they have, they're going to have to be defunded. And perhaps the whole idea of state-funded intellectuals is a thing of the past, which is ultimately what academics now are. So I am a bit pessimistic about refor reforming of the universities, but I'm actually much more optimistic about the reform of the science institutions. The replication crisis is a wake-up call that the science has got huge problems. And in fact, the science institutions are already trying to do something about it, especially in the biomedical area. Um, disciplines are, are really going into that. However, if you're in a sort of field of research like the Great Barrier Reef, we've still got a long way to go. You'll still be labelled a denier. And even though these scientists, like the chief scientist, will quite uh, easily acknowledge that there is a replication crisis, it's just not in the Great Barrier Reef, right? So apparently, all those marine biologists, they never make any mistakes, even though in the rest of science, it's a 50% uh, failure rate. The fact that about half the science is probably wrong is not as worrying as, it, as you think, because I reckon 95% of the science has no applications. It actually doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> so, and then there's a small amount of science. It might be about 1% of science, which is actually used for industrial applications. And those industries will usually, if they've got any brains, check the science. And by the way, when they do, they find in the medical area that it can be wrong up to 80% of the science. So that then leaves an area of science which I call policy science. And this is the science which is useful and used by governments. And this is the stuff which is the, the really damaging stuff, because if the, the governments are using science which isn't properly checked, which is totally the case, then they're almost certainly making policy uh, that is not the best. And generally speaking, I'm saying, well, if the government is going to use this science, then the government needs to check this science. And I estimate that on the Great Barrier Reef, they handed out about $450 million last year. If you just spent 1% of that to check the science, you'd find an awful lot of problems. And it, the other thing that it would do is make those, all those um, scientists a little bit more careful about what they produce. The reason that auditors almost never find problems with the accounts in companies and, and, com and, uh, companies and um, you know, public institutions is that those people know they're going to be audited. So there's no point in trying to do something illegal. You probably will be caught, or at least there's an, enough risk that you'll avoid it. At the moment, there is no risk for scientists. Even if you're found wrong, there doesn't seem to be any reputational damage. We've got to make it such that there is damage if you get it wrong. So to this end, I've been proposing what I call an Office for Science Quality Assurance. It's something which has got up in the Queensland uh, Liberal National Party um, in, um, in a conference the other week. And the idea of this would be to do the checks on the science that is being used to uh, inform government. Now, of course, the problem there is, and I'm sure you're all thinking of this, how do you stop such an organisation being captured by the organisation, the science institutions it's, it's designed to check? And this is where I think we can actually learn from two other professions. The first one is the financial people. How do we make it such that uh, financial auditors don't get captured by the institutions that they're checking? It must be possible to do something similar with science. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the legal profession. Um, how is it that, that in a court case, you know, it might be a, a murder case, that we, we always seem to manage to be able to always get a debate between the two sides of the argument? Now, that doesn't occur in science. It's supposed to happen, but generally speaking, it doesn't happen. But you guys in the legal profession, I guess you've been doing it for a few hundred years, you know how to do that. And so you always have a defence and you always have a prosecution. And I suspect if the defence and prosecution start colluding, there might be some fairly harsh penalties involved in that. That doesn't happen in science. In fact, collusion is the name of the game. You get a consensus statement. You collude with everybody and you make an, an argument and that's the end of it. So we need to learn from the legal profession how to guarantee a vigorous argument uh, to make sure we get uh, closer to the truth. So essentially what I've been arguing here is that at, bottom of, at the bottom of the problems which we have in the universities and in fact the science institutions is that we don't have enough debate. We've got to make sure there's systems to, to engender that. In terms of free speech, I sometimes hear it said that there's no dollars in freedom of speech. 
Well, if you ask the farmers of North Queensland at the moment who are being absolutely steamrolled by massive amounts of red tape that's really going to affect their livelihoods, it's already affecting their livelihoods, you know, you'd have to disagree. Freedom of speech is incredibly important and um, we've got to get it back into both our science institutions and our, our university. Thank you very much. Thank you.